because a Buddhist looks at that and says, well that's really the goal which I'm supposed to be aiming for. What does it really mean and how relevant is it for me in my daily life? And you may have come here many times and know that uh, my goal as a teacher is to try and bring those esoteric, exotic, sort of philosophical teachings down to earth so they can give us meaning in our life. <coughs> and that's basically how I taught what enlightenment means to us. Not as some distant goal or some other attainment which we can wear on our hats and say, look at me, I'm enlightened and how many enlightened people we've got in our group. Because uh, things like that tend to uh, just be another expression of one's ego and self, as if enlightenment is just like getting a PhD from a university and you get it from the Buddhist Society of WA instead of the University of WA. And that's really not what these things are all about. So let's uh, bring enlightenment down to earth. I gave a simile, uh, and one of those stories from my youth. Remember as, uh, when I was at university, I used to enjoy just uh, spending my vacations in the quiet places of, well, UK. So I used to just take a tent and a rucksack and just go hiking in the, in the mountains of Scotland. I remember I used to camp out there by myself for days on end, meditating, just enjoying just being alone in nature. It was the nearest thing I could do, get to, like being in the bush. I even though that sometimes that people say, where did you grow up? And say, I often say I was actually, grew up in the bush, shepherd's bush. <laughs> the suburb of London, but it's still the bush, we used to call it. <laughs> but the first opportunity, I'd always try and get away from that city, or the city of Cambridge where I was studying, and go up to Scotland where there's emptiness and space and freedom. I remember just one experience, so just one day, just I was a young man, went with another uh, fellow just to climb the nearest mountain, had a wonderful time just trekking up to the top. And he decided to go back to, I think, the youth hostel where I was staying. But I saw another mountain. It was a beautiful day. So I decided to climb up that mountain as well by myself. But just as I got to the top, the clouds descended out of nowhere. And I was completely enshrouded in mist. Could not find my bearings at all. Even just looking at my hand at the end of its arm, I could not see it. The mist was so thick. And the surprising thing, it came so quickly. I realized just how dangerous those mountains can be. But, you know, you know your directions, you know, you know where you come from. So I just turned around and started walking back the way I, was, I came from. I was very fortunate because I'd only walked a few, uh, few minutes. I was mindful enough to see that the mist actually did clear underneath me as I saw a vertical drop, a cliff going hundreds of meters down. If I'd have been a little bit unmindful, I would have been dead. But I saw that and it's, it scared me. Later on I found out that where that cliff was on the map. And I'd been walking in the completely opposite direction I thought I was going in. That's what happens in the mist. Sometimes you lose your directions. But the illusion is you really think you know where you're going, but you don't. It's just like life, isn't it? Sometimes we think we know where we're going. We think we're going in the direction of wisdom, peace, happiness, freedom. But then we end up just you know, more enslaved, you know, less happy, and just peace seems to be more distant from us. It's like walking through the mist. But fortunately I had enough um, sense to figure out a way to escape from that dangerous predicament. I realized that the mist always is high. So as long as I walk down, eventually I'll come below the mist and be able to find out where, where I was. And that's what I did, I just chose any direction which was downwards. Not worrying whether it was east, west, north or south, as long as it was downwards. And I could always do that, always choose the downward path. 
And as I went down, 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 sure enough, after half an hour I came below the mist and I could actually see where I was and get some landmarks and get back to the place where I was staying. And I used that story as a simile of, of the way to enlightenment, the way to peace, to freedom, to happiness. Even though we can't see the final destination, because you know, the mist enshrouds us, still we can see what is leading, in my case, in the mountains, downwards to freedom. In the simile that means we can see what makes our life a little bit more peaceful, makes our heart a little bit more happy, makes us feel a little bit more free. And if we follow that path, that is a path which leads to enlightenment. Now, that's a simile which I made up, but it is very, very close to how the Buddha taught the path of enlightenment, which he taught very similar things to uh, the first bhikkhuni, the first Buddhist nun, Mahapajapati, and he also taught that to uh, one of the great monks, Upali, the barber. It was a case that whatever leads to more peace, to a bigger sense of freedom, to more stillness, to more inner happiness, the Buddha said that that is the teachings of the Buddha. Those are the precepts, that's the path. What he was teaching us was the way downwards out of the mist of delusion, to freedom from the cliffs and the dangers, and freedom from the pain. So instead of a person being so philosophical and talking about things they can't really see and can't really know about enlightenment or God or these other amazing things, I think it's much more practical, more useful to bring these teachings down to earth and to see what makes your life more peaceful, more free, more happy. And if we follow that path, we know that that must lead to the place we want to go, a place of freedom, a place of happiness, a place of peace. And it's, that simile also works, because in the path towards enlightenment, the path of peace, of freedom, of inner happiness, you just go so far, a little bit further, a little bit further, and most of the myths disappear, we call that the streaming experience. And then you can actually see the goal. You're below the mists. And then you can really understand what enlightenment is and how powerful and wonderful it is. But it doesn't matter. Whatever makes you more peaceful, inner happiness, true happiness and more freedom. You understand that <coughs> is the way to enlightenment. So when we know that, there's certain things which people do in life, you know, that's not the path, that's not what we should be doing. Enlightened people don't get angry and don't shout at other people with hatred. Enlightened people just don't amass so many possessions in their life and sort of creates less sense of freedom. Even today some visitors came uh, to my monastery and they wanted to see my cave again. It's a, the local tourist attraction in Serpentine. It's the Ajahn Brahm's cave. And I don't mind showing people that because that's almost better than a, than a Dharma talk. That's actually where I live and where I meditate. And it's just a very small, I think it's about three meter diameter cave, maybe three meter high, like a hemisphere. And there's hardly anything in it. This is my clock and a couple of bottles of water, three mats which I can lay out to sleep on and a pillow. And that's my worldly possessions in that little cave. I do have other things in the office which is next door, but this is actually where I spend most of my time when I'm in Serpentine Monastery. It reminds me that you know, even though you travel around the world, and uh, I invite you to complain to the federal government, because a conference which I went to, two days before I left, the airline ticket came and I was surprised that the Australian government who funded the ticket gave me business class. And that's your taxes. 
For you know I enjoy much more just that little hut and the little cave in which I sleep in. It's more, I feel it's much nicer as a monk being in such a place. You feel that that's where you're supposed to be. And that's why people like visiting it, because of its simplicity. And the people who visited today, I told them that it's so much nicer living in a place where there's few things to burden you. The very emptiness of that and the simplicity of the place where I live reminds me of the emptiness and simplicity of a mind in meditation. Where you're not carrying so many possessions and burdens around with you. When you become a monk you have to let go of so many things. But you do so, so willingly, because you wonder why do people bother and carry all these things. Just look at all the things you have in your room, in your house. And sometimes, well, do I really need all of those things and can't I get rid of some more? You find it's much more peaceful and much more freeing, the less you have. And you think in my mind, can't I let go of a few more things in my mind, my internal possessions and worries and fears? It's much more peaceful the more free your mind is, the emptier it is. And to be, have an empty mind doesn't mean, actually you don't really need to leave the world. You just need how just to learn how to let go of things. And it's that path of letting go, which is symbolized by a simple empty hut, is what is a path towards enlightenment, what gives you a clue what it truly is. But it's not so much the possessions of the world, it's the possessions in your mind, that's what we really need to let go of. Just uh, before I went to Singapore and after going to Cambodia, I had a wonderful experience in Bangkok, which shows you just the beauty of learning how to let go. Because this was an experience, one of the Disciples in Bangkok has been following me around for the last few years as a reporter for the Bangkok Post. And the reason why she started following me around was that she gave an interview. And part of the interview she asked, well, you know, what's the Buddhist view on euthanasia? Or mercy killing? And many of you have heard me say this before, but I told her that well, let's give it a concrete example. Suppose your mother is in a coma in hospital for several months and there's no real possibility of, of any cure. And someone asks you, should we turn off the ventilator? Should we turn off the life support system? And as a Buddhist, what should you do? Because that's your mother. As I said this, her jaw dropped and she said, wow, you're good, because her mother was in a hospital on a life support system, in a coma. <laughs> and she'd been like that for quite a while. I sort of nailed it. But of course the advice which I give, which is important for everyone to know, is that if that's your mother or anyone close to you, sit next to her hold her hand and even though she's in a coma ask her if she's there if she wants to go you know there's a lot of difference between a person who is just a dead body being kept alive by the machines and a being who's still in that body just struggling to survive and live on there's a lot of difference there. And if that's someone you love and know, you can feel it. You can feel that there's somebody there. And if there's somebody there, keep the ventilator going. There's one of the uh, people I know, she told her story of what it was like being in a coma. It's a great story because she made a full recovery and goes around telling her story in, in public forums about what it's like to be in a coma for many days. She said she went to a very, very dark black place. Don't know for how long, timeless. I think it was actually for several weeks. And she said, what brought her back? She said she heard the sound of temple bells. 
no Buddhist temple bells. That's how she described it. Where that came from, who knows. But that brought her out of that darkness and soon into her body. And when she was in that body, she could not speak or move, but she could see, hear and feel everything which was going on around her, but not being able to respond. And after a while, she saw her sons come to visit, which of course delighted her, but she could not say that she was being delighted. She had no way of responding to what they said to their kisses or holding their hand. But she got terrified when the doctor came and said that their mother had no chance of coming out of the coma and asked the children, the nearest of kin, for permission to turn off the life support. She heard them saying that and she was thinking, no, I'm still here, don't turn it off. But she couldn't move her mouth, nor any other part of the body. Being in Singapore, or it could have been, I think it was in Malaysia, sorry. Being a Chinese family, the children said, well, it's the eldest son's decision. And the eldest son <laughs> said, no, don't leave me alone, I want your help on this. But of course, no one wants to make such a decision to turn off the machine of your own mother. So they passed the buck to the eldest son and he had to choose whether his mother would die right there. And of course, she could not move her body, certainly not her lips, not even her eyes, but she could certainly move her mind and she wished and willed and concentrated her mind to say, son, don't, 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 I'm here. And the son said, no, give her another day. In that 24 hours, she was able to move her hand, enough to show the doctor that something was happening, that a recovery seemed to be happening. And of course, because she could tell that story, she did make a total recovery. And you wouldn't think that she had been in that situation if you saw her today. Many other people have had those sorts of experiences. She's not alone. The interesting thing is that sometimes the doctors look at that person on the bed in the ICU and think, shall we turn it off? And this is how you know. So I told her, no, don't turn it off if you think she's still there. So she went to see her mum and she had a very strong feeling that her mother was still there. She kept it going. And of course, having sussed out the situation so well the first time, she was very impressed with me. And so I'd always go and visit her mother in the hospital. But I went to visit her last Saturday. Saturday afternoon after coming back from Cambodia, one of the first things I did. But as soon as I went into the room, I knew that she was close to death. So instead of just going and talking to her, even though she's in coma, you knew she's there, you went up to her and told her how to die. This family were quite shocked I was speaking like that. I said it in Thai. I'm fluent enough in Thai and also understanding on how you really let go. And I mean, it says, this is what you do when you die. And you have to let go of your body and the physical feelings of pain and all the other things which you own, your family and everything else. Let go of your past, because sometimes we remember when we die some of the terrible things which we've done. And none of us have always been saints. I've done my fair share of stupid things. When, before I was a monk, that was. <laughs> Even in my early years as a monk as well. But. We don't carry those with us. We can drop them. It's an amazing thing when you know the nature of the mind, and the nature of truth. There's nothing, nothing which you can't forgive if you really let it go. There's no terrible act which you have done in the past, or terrible speech which you can't, just through the understanding of the wet nature of the mind, forgive yourself of. 
That's why we always say in Buddhism, you just acknowledge, you've got to recognize it, and then forgive it, and then learn from it, move on. But never sort of carry it around with you. And certainly not into a death. You let it go straight away. So I was teaching her many ways of letting go, letting go of her old body, and letting go of her past. Not worrying about the future. Where should I get reborn? What heaven should I go to? What happens next? All of that we should let go of, just as we teach you in meditation. I taught her how to die. But there was a problem. So I turned round. She had her husband in the room and her two daughters. That's the only family she really had, you know, the close family. The younger daughter, who was a journalist, she was fine. I've been teaching her a long time. But the oldest daughter, she wasn't happy at all. She was so attached to her mother that when I told her your mother's about to die, even the doctors hadn't said that, she started weeping. So I told her, well I've told many people, please give your mother permission to go. You have to let her go. And I don't mean just half-heartedly, fully go up to her and give her your blessing to depart this life. Because you are what's holding her back. And she accepted that and understood that. I was quite surprised at how easily that really got into her head, into her mind. And after I left, she did go up to her mother, talk to her, and free her, let her go. She passed away 24 hours later. And I was fortunate enough to do part of the funeral service. In Thailand the funeral service is just so long and drawn out. The death only takes a couple of minutes, but the funerals take a hundred days. There's something very wrong there, but that's tradition. But fortunately I went to do the first part of the funeral service. And it was one of the most, that was on Monday evening, it was one of the most wonderful times to see the closest relations, the husband and the two daughters, totally at peace with their mother's death, because her mother had died well, had died beautifully, and there wasn't tears, there wasn't the sense of grief, there was a sense that they'd let go and what a wonderful freeing experience that was for everybody. And that's the sort of thing which we call a step downwards out of the mist, going towards more freedom, more peace, more this inner happiness which is a taste of enlightenment or a taste of freedom. It's those taste of freedom which we have in those experiences which give us the indication of what this enlightenment is. In the same way when you have a new food which you haven't eaten before, you don't just gobble it all down, you just taste it first of all. And peace and freedom and happiness, when you taste it, it tastes delicious. And that still I remember was the reason why, I be one of the main reasons I became a Buddhist, was that the first time you meditated, only 15 minutes, but it tasted just so nice. Probably the first real moments of peace I'd experienced in my whole life up to that point. There was something about peace, I mean real inner peace, which actually was addictive. Because to me it was the only thing which really mattered, the only real happiness in life. Even though that he went to great universities, I know that sometimes people say, oh what a waste of a life, Ajahn Brahm, you got great degrees from a great university. I could have been a great scientist, I could have made nuclear bombs. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes scientists end up doing such things. No, you could have done you know, other good things with your brain. And actually I did do good things with my brain, I became a monk. Best thing I could possibly do. Well, one of the reasons I never carried on with research, you saw all the other professors. And being a college system in Cambridge, 
you actually associated with these pre- uh, these uh, lecturers. Remember, one of them lived next door to me in the in the college um, dormitories. He was living there rather than at home. So you got to know them personally. And I was very surprised just how they were just so much, so much, so intelligent in their field. They were genius in saying chemistry. Remember, our master was a Nobel Prize winner. So, you know, I had dinner with him every now and again. Having dinner, sitting next to someone who's won a Nobel Prize in chemistry and realizing how stupid they are in life. Brilliant in chemistry, but got no understanding of what inner happiness, peace, or harmony. They can't even <coughs> live with their wife without having arguments. And you wonder, just, is that what I want to use the gift of intelligence for? You know, just to get prizes and become famous, or just to get a good salary? And I realized that's not what intelligence is for. I want something more meaningful than that. So I chose a path of inner peace. I thought that was much more important. And you realize that you were descending out from the mist going to deeper states of peace and happiness and freedom. Which is why the enlightenment is. Just with your partner in life, learning how to forgive them. Even though that sometimes they don't deserve forgiveness. But every time you do this wonderful act of letting go of forgiving the past, you feel a sense of deeper peace and a freedom from that past. I'd like to mention that all those bad feelings which people carry around with them, all the pain of what happened to you, and how unfair it always was, why do you cling on to that? Why do you allow the past to continue hurting you? That's what's happening until you let it go. You're a prisoner of the pain of your past. When you put it that way, you're a prisoner of the pain of your past. You realize what you're doing to yourself. And in that prison of the past, the cell doors are always open. You can walk out whenever you want. One of the stories which was told to me by one of the early members of this Buddhist society who was very supportive over twenty years ago. I've lost track of him now, I'm not sure where he is. But he told me of a wonderful story of his life. He was born in Sydney and as a young boy, six or seven, I don't know, roughly that sort of age, he was playing with his best friend on a pier in one of the many bays of Sydney Harbour. Just two boys messing around. He pushed his best friend in the water for a joke. His best friend drowned. He'd killed his best friend. And his best friend's parents lived next door. He had to see the tears and the pain of parents who lost their seven-year-old, drowned who lost their, his future. Even though after a few weeks the parents went up to him, to knew he was sad and said, Look, you're just a kid playing around. No need to feel guilty. It wasn't your fault. How can you blame a six or seven year old? You know, probably you've done that, pushing your best friend in the water. It just happened to he drowned at that time. But he was never able to forgive himself. Having seen his best friend drown, and seeing the pain in the parents, because they lived next door, he couldn't get away from it. He had such a trauma inside of himself that he never did well at school, had time, difficult time finding a girlfriend, because he had this terrible guilt eating him inside. But he told me that just one day when he was about 17 or 18, he literally woke up in the morning and it's just an insight, a realization, I don't need to feel guilty anymore. He said it was as simple as that. 
just the realization that the cell door of his guilt was open and he was allowed to walk out and let it go. Now you can imagine that story. Why does a five-year-old or six or seven-year-old feel so guilty? But you do. Now you may be 16 or 30 or 50-year-old, but you all make mistakes, I make mistakes, so surely we should let it go. You can let it go. One of the beautiful parts of the Buddhist religion, if you want to call it a religion, is that there is no sin and punishment. That's just not part of Buddhist religion. If you want to sin and punishment, just go to the churches or whatever they, and just, if you want hellfire and damnation, you'll never get it here. <laughs> but, too often we just can't do that. And you come here and I've got to work on you, condition you, brainwash you week after week until finally you get the message and you walk out of the pain of your past and become free. When you do that, you feel what enlightenment is like. You're having another taste of freedom, a taste of peace, a taste of the wisdom which liberates you. Now can you get an understanding of what enlightenment is, if you can go further down that path. Forgiving yourself, freeing yourself. Oh, you look at life. And I went to this interfaith conference over in Phnom Penh, a complete waste of time. <laughs> Just, you know, Buddhist ideas were not completely ignored. You know, we were just basically to serve as ornaments, but Practically speaking, we were just off the agenda. And sometimes you do other things like that, and a complete waste of time. You want to fix things up. You know, I just came back from, and looked in the newspaper on the airplane coming home, and our Premier of Western Australia, Paul Allen Carpenter, was in problems again. Our Prime Ministers or Premiers are always in problems. So sometimes you think, is it the person or is it just a job? <laughs> you know it's a job really, not the person. It's just life is a problem, it's not you. I understand just what life is all about. Yeah, you can sort of you know, say your piece, write your letters, do your complaining, but yeah, it doesn't really change, does it? Your life just goes on. Every now and again, as a monk, you go on retreat. It's great going on retreat, especially the long retreats. You know, like six months retreat. And you read the newspapers beforehand. And then you go on six months, bye bye world, you don't know anything which is going on for six months. And you read newspapers afterwards. Same stories, just different names. <laughs> same wars, only different locations. Same corruption, only different scallywags. There's something about that life. It's, sometimes it's really fortunate being a monk because you know people tell you all their personal stories. And I always remember just when I came over here to Australia and I see people telling me their stories because they come like for couch. It's great coming to see a monk. You, know, you come to see a monk and tell the problems, get some nice advice. At the very least, you won't get criticized. And that's one of the nice things about telling your problems to a monk. You know, that you, never ever will I blame you or say, you stupid idiot, what do you do that for? I don't <laughs> say that. But it was fascinating, the first problem I thought, wow, that's really interesting, you know, like married problems. And then the second person came along and told me their problems. And, then, and a bell rang, I said, I've heard that before. And then the third one comes along, here we go again. <laughs> They're the same problems. And you come and tell me about your kids and not behaving, or your husband not talking to you, or your boss at work, you know, being rude to you. Oh, but I don't know how many thousands of times I've heard that same problem again and again and again. You know, it's a great test of my patience, but I'm pretty successful about being patient when you tell me your problem. You all think it's just your problem, individual and unique. But I let into a secret. It's been a long time since I've heard a unique problem. <laughs> You're all the same. And so you get the idea, oh this is actually life. 
So yeah, you try and fix it up, you haven't got much chance of fixing it up. So instead you make peace with life. Prime Ministers, Premiers, that's just what they're like. Banks, <laughs> that's what they're so like. Okay, go on to start a new bank yourself, you try a new bank. After a while it'll be just the same as every other bank. <laughs> or jobs or whatever. So there's a certain like sameness about life. And so after a while, yeah you participate in life and try and make it better but don't have too many hopes. <laughs> <laughs> Instead, learn to make peace with life. Just the way you make peace with yourself. If you try and fix yourself up and make yourself a better person, it's such hard work. <laughs> And sometimes it actually makes you a worse person. It's a strange thing when you accept yourself as you are. Have a bit of, make peace with yourself. You make peace with life. You make peace with the government. You make peace with the banks. You make peace with the airlines. who are never on time, always late. It's interestingly that, because I've got lots of disciples in Singapore, so on the flight from Singapore to Phnom Penh, it was delayed for two or three hours. And I was told when I got to Singapore a few days later that the, the person on the counter at Singapore Airlines, sort of on the counter in the boarding gate, she told her friend, she said, oh, you know, I saw this, this monk. So I don't know if it was your monk, you know, it was, it was their monk, it was me. He said, He's actually, all the other people were complaining, getting upset, but he was smiling all the time. <laughs> so yeah, that was me. <laughs> Who cares, you know, when you saw the plane is late? You know, no, no amount of banging the desk or shouting makes that plane get there earlier. So I actually quite enjoyed that, because, you know, I could actually get another cup of tea. So there's always benefits to become when your plane is late. So but it's interesting that I was noticed and I was reported. <laughs> That's great being a monk like that because yeah, the pains will be like, you accept and make more peace with life. I don't say you don't complain afterwards, actually I did complain to Qantas when the pain was delayed for 24, 25 hours, but I knew exactly what I was doing. Because I was told about this by another business lady because we shared a taxi for the hotel which they put us up late at night. And she told me, said, oh, you should write a complaining letter because you'll probably get something back from Qantas. And I did, I got like a free flight to go to Sydney next time. <laughs> so it's all right to complain if you know, sort of, you're just doing a, a bit of fun. <laughs> and to save the Buddhist society a bit of money because they didn't know, need to pay for the plane fare next time. So it actually says your donations can go somewhere else. But you don't take these things so seriously and get really caught up in it and get upset in it. And that way, you have a feeling of peace. You can shout up there, say your peace, but it doesn't affect your heart. I remember Ajahn Sumato, the, he's the abbot of our monastery in England, teaching me that once. He was just visiting our monastery in Thailand, because he'd already gone over to, to England. And we had like a nun there, she was a French nun. Very nice lady, but she was, basically she was anorexic, she just would not eat. Not because she wanted to be beautiful, because she thought fasting was a way to get enlightened. You know, sometimes people get too ascetic when they become, become monks or nuns. You know, I don't have that problem. <laughs> <laughs> but she was really just getting so thin, we were really worried about her health. It's very hard to force someone to eat. So you know, this monk came along and we said, Now, Ajahn Samela, you've got more wisdom, can you, can you do something? And he got up there and he was shouting at her and screaming at her. And I thought, my goodness, you know, this monk has lost it. He's got angry. <laughs> and I really thought, you know, this monk I really, really respected and I really thought was you know, really close to being enlightened. I thought, my goodness. What's he doing? And this nun sort of you know, walked away, quite shaken, visibly shaken. 
And then this Ajahn Sumedha turned around to me and he had this big broad smile, so that told her, didn't it? <laughs> and I know you just can't be angry, really angry, and then suddenly smile and just be at peace. Because real anger, it sort of makes an impression on you, a mark in you, it's like a, and it takes a long time for you to cool down. He was actually playing, like acting it out, because he thought maybe that might sort of help this lady. So if you're very, very smart, I don't think many of you can do this. <laughs> you can actually do that, but you're not holding it, it's not part of you. It's not a personal involvement in the situation, therefore you can let it go immediately. And it wasn't it's very different to anger, it's almost like an actor going on stage and doing that for a purpose. I was very impressed with that, because it was just immediate. As soon as that lady went, this monk was as peaceful and happy as normal. And real anger, you just can't stop it like that. It lasts afterwards. So I was very impressed with that. That's just the way this world is. And so, after a while, we learn not to carry so much around with us. It's that freedom, that letting go is what enlightenment is like. And you don't have to read this in a book. You feel this in your heart. And you feel what peace is, what freedom is, and what inner happiness is. Even though the books confirm that, which is why every now and again you read out suttas and just so people know, yeah, what you're actually saying is actually what the Buddha said. But you know, I don't sort of say it in Pali like the Buddha said it in, but in English. The way of freedom and peace. If you keep following that path, you find the peace and the freedom grows and grows and grows. Even just in the meditation retreat I taught, you know, that was two Fridays when I wasn't here. I just kept on making this point about what I call these days meditation karma. I like this idea of like, the law of karma because it's very useful for actually understanding what goes on and why things happen. And good meditation karma means if you're being aggressive in your meditation, yeah, I'm going to sort of force myself through pain. My knees ache, who cares? I'm much stronger than this. I'm going to be sort of super monk. Pain doesn't sort of really bother me, I'm much tougher than that. Or, you know, if you just say, well, my mind's all over the place, come on, get your act together. Or you say, yeah, this is it, I'm really good, I really want enlightenment, come on, I really want, 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 want. If you're making bad meditation calm, which means like thoughts of ill will, thoughts of violence, thoughts of wanting something, we call that bad meditation karma. Ill will, fighting, never makes the mind peaceful. No more than Mr. Bush can create peace in Iraq by sending in the army. You don't make peace through battles, through fighting, through war. You all know that. But you should know that in your mind as well. Bad meditation karma is actually fighting your mind, having ill will, feeling embarrassed about some of the things which go on in your head. Good meditation karma is making peace with it, being kind, being compassionate, forgiving, being gentle. That's what we call good meditation karma. That's also called Right intention, second factor of the Eightfold Path, if you want to know, the Buddha taught that. Thoughts of kindness, gentleness and letting go. And what Ajahn Chah said, you don't meditate to get things. You meditate to let go of things, to be more free, to be more empty. Not to have so much things in your mind. Now when we make good meditation karma, being kind, being gentle, letting go, the result of karma, if you make peace, you get peace. If you are kind, you feel the, the gentleness of warmth, of kindness. And if you are non-violent, you, know, you feel healthy and free. So what happens when you make good meditation karma? 
What you're doing here is you're going downhill in the mist. You know it's good, it's good karma, kindness, gentleness, peace, letting go. You're not quite sure where it will lead because you're still in the mist, but it's good karma, you know it is. And the more you go in that direction, you have to go under the mist, you have to get to the safety spot below the mountains. In the same way, as long as you keep making peace, being kind, being gentle, then you know you are on the path to enlightenment. The more times you make peace with this moment, no matter what it is, the more peace you'll have in your life. The more you're kind to every moment which comes in your life, the more your heart will be big and beautiful. And the more gentle you are with every moment, no matter what comes into your life, the more gentle you are, so again the more freedom you'll feel. This is why, no matter what happens to you in any moment in your life, stuck in the traffic, and get done by a speed camera, or whatever else happens to you in your life, you find yourself got diagnosed with a cancer, you may not be able to get rid of the external problem, but you sure can make peace with it. It's just part of life. Make peace with it. Don't make war with life. And if you can do that, you'll find that you are more of a peaceful person because you made peace in so many moments. You do that in meditation, but you can also do that in your life. And the difficult things in your life, things which you can't change, please make peace with them. Please be kind. Your partner leaves you. Make peace with it. It's par, par for the course. The painful experiences in life, that's what we learn from. If Ajahn Chah used to say, because I hated the mosquitoes, because they were always irritating you, and the tired of mosquitoes, they wouldn't just bite you, just like some of the Australian mosquitoes, they'd fly around in your ear many, many times to talk to you, here I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm going to bite, I'm going to bite. And that's actually, you know, psychological torture. So can't you just get it over with? Tell the mosquitoes, no, no, bzz, 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 I'm going to come. <laughs> I mean, so Ajahn Chah told us to call them Ajahn, which means teacher, mosquito. They are our teachers. So you can say Ajahn, husband. <laughs> Ajahn, wife. Ajahn, teenage son. <laughs> They're there to teach you something. And what they teach us, how we can make peace with anything. You know, there's a, there's a big problem in the healing professions. Because I was talking to this with some psychologists in Sydney last year. You know that sometimes it's so hard, you get sort of a client who's really, really suffering. And they're in great pain, psychological pain. But they won't let you help them. You can't do anything with them. He said, that's so frustrating, just like a doctor. Sometimes you see that patient, maybe a young person, so much life in front of them, but no treatment is possible. Or even like a vet, he sees like a well-loved cat or dog, can't do anything. He said, that's so frustrating. I said, what do you mean, you can't do anything? The problem, I think, with many of those professions is they don't make a distinction between healing and being kind. So sometimes you can't heal them. They're going to get sick, they die, they're in pain. But you can always, in every occasion, be kind. So that's what a therapist can always do. Be kind. So even if the person is dying, even if the animal is in great pain, even if the psychotic is going crazy, you can always be kind. And never underestimate that power of kindness. It's good karma. And good karma has good effects. And sometimes miracles do happen. Why? Because the power of kindness 
So every time you are kind, you are gentle, you let go, you make peace, you are going towards enlightenment. You get a taste for it. You know what it is. The more you go down that path, the more you feel this is what enlightenment is. It's only an amplification of that which kindness brings you. It's a deepening of the peace which you can feel every now and again in your life. It's a more intense and extensive and thorough freedom which you can experience every time you just let go of something. So you all have experience of a little bit of peace, a little bit of kindness, a little bit of forgiveness and freedom. Now imagine what that's like if it expands, deepens and becomes rich and thorough going throughout your whole body and mind. Now that's what enlightenment is. So you can know it, not as a theory, not as some sort of description, not as some unattainable goal which is saying, yeah, you have to be a monk or a nun and specially born to become enlightened these days. No, something which you can know in your heart. You can feel. Not only in this manner do you know what enlightenment is, but you also know the path. It feels the right way to go. And you walk that path, whether you like it or not. Peace, calm, freedom. You feel your way there. You don't think your way to enlightenment. You feel your way there. It's an emotional maturity, not an intellectual achievement. And that way, you know where you're heading. And the reason I give this talk is because Sometimes, coming to a Buddhist society where enlightenment is the goal, is like getting on a bus, which looks nice, but you haven't got a hell of an idea where it's going to. Sometimes you come here, where is this going to lead to, if I keep coming here too often? <laughs> Am I going to have to let go of my husband? And does it mean no more sex? Does it mean I have to get a let go of my job and can't play golf anymore? Ah! No, you know it leads to more peace, more freedom, real inner freedom. This beautiful happiness, an intense inspiration. That's what this leads to. And enlightenment is just that intensified, taking it to the limit. Which means you no need to feel afraid of enlightenment. You don't need to be afraid of taking that next step. A little bit more peace, a little bit more happiness, a little bit more freedom, why not? And that's also why we talk like this here. Talk about letting go of the problems of people's ordinary lives. That is not just second-rate Buddhism. It's not just a sop to lay Buddhists and you know, talk differently to, monk, to monks or nuns. This is all about the path. No difference. The essence making peace, being kind, letting go. That's all you need to do and it feels good. So now you all know what enlightenment is, you will know how to get there and it's a pretty nice journey. So thank you for listening. Any questions? Any questions, comments or complaints? Yes, go on, yeah. What is the difference between uh, just letting go and being used by other people? I've let go so much I'm used by people all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't ride, use me. <laughs> I am used, I'm exploited, I admit that. <laughs> but I think what you really mean is that sometimes that people just uh, are really quite cool to you. And so that's why that sometimes I say you can stand up and you can shout. You know, you can, that story, if you read it in the book, Opening the Door of Your Heart, actually there's a new edition coming out. So I got my first copy today. It's got a new cover, same inside. It's like being reincarnated, I call it. <laughs> 
But anyhow, so in that, <laughs> sort of in that sort of book, I, I, there's this story. It's a very classic story of the the bad snake, and a bad snake basically got converted and being a sort of a Buddhist, took the five precepts, and kids went along and they they sort of. Uh, hit that snake and the snake wouldn't fight back. He was just being exploited because of his kindness and his gentleness. And suddenly you think like that as a Buddhist. Do you know he's supposed to take everything which people throw at us? Are we supposed to take injustice and inequity and all these things? Why can't we have rights for Buddhists? It's okay to do that. Now I was joined in the, uh, some of the uh, peace rallies for Burma. I missed the one for Tibet because I was, actually I was um, overseas and had another invitation when one was held here. So it's alright for, for monks to, and for yourself, to stand up just like the bad snake. It's the, the teacher snake told that, that bad snake, look, you should never bite anybody, but it's alright to hiss. Because all the snake needs to protect itself is just to get up and hiss at you. If, it, if a snake came along and hissed at you, you'd run. So that's what <laughs> he said. And those Buddhists, you can hiss, but just don't bite. In other words, you can be assertive without harming anybody. So, you know, if it's in your, your family, an in, interesting thing. Suppose like a Buddhist falls in love with, say, a Catholic or a Muslim. And they say, well, you know, you have to change your faith and become a Muslim like me. No way! If you love me, you should become a Buddhist. <laughs> you can hiss a little bit. And in the end you say, okay, we've come to a compromise. I'll be a Buddhist, you'll be a Muslim. <laughs> now why not? If we are going to be able to live together in the world, there's no way we can have just all Buddhists in the world, or all Muslims, or all Christians. We have to learn how to live together. Not just as neighbours, but as husbands and wives. Why not? So we should be a little bit assertive. And lovely to see some sort of disciples in places like Singapore do that. Because you know, they've got enough freedom there. Now, some of the people think Singapore isn't free, but it's, sometimes it's a remarkably free country in many ways. You know, because you know, the government is very forceful, they can actually maintain freedoms and keep religions in check. And sometimes I think religions do need to be kept in check. We need somebody over us to stop us going to too much extremes. But anyway, um, yeah, you can always be, you can always hiss a bit. <laughs> I did a fair amount of hissing at the conference in Phnom Penh. So, any other questions or comments on enlightenment? Oh, you've got two over there, my goodness. He's got one as well. He's a husband and wife. To, to further that one, it's just that you hiss all the time, then they know that you're just going to hiss, and so they get too intensified. Ah, okay. So, if you do that all the time, you're being exploited, and you just hiss, they find out because they've read my book and listened to my talks and say, <laughs> OK, we know what they're doing, they're only hissing, they won't bite anymore. <laughs> Actually, hissing could be quite effective sometimes. So, you can not just hiss yourself, you can get all of your other friends to hiss. And when all of our Buddhists stand together, we hiss together. <coughs> We've got 2.11% of the population, that's a lot of hissing. <laughs> It's amazing just what sort of uh, peaceful but assertive action can achieve. Quite well, no, no, it's not quite well. You're never pretending that you're going to bite. So there's other ways of being like forceful, being assertive without being aggressive. And sometimes, I mean, you take um, the prime example of that is. Um, the Gandhi non-peace movement in India. Who, you know, he was he was responsible for throwing the British Empire out of its jewel in the crown. It's amazing just the power of that sort of movement in India at that particular time. I don't think no violence would have got rid of the British Raj in India. 
but that did. That was an amazing story. So, never underestimate the power of hissing. <laughs> if it's done the right way. So you had a question too? I'll give an example, yeah, it's just, uh, oh, that's just in the, who's I supposed to be making peace and harmony in our region, and basically Asian region, and also uh, New Zealand and Australia. But just a little thing that our delegation from Australia had, say, three Muslims, I was the only Buddhist. And you know that the demography of Australia is 2.1% of Buddhists, 1.7% of, of Muslims. So you know, even the delegation was skewed. And just what happens is if you're just alone, have no one to support you, sometimes you know, what you say doesn't really get heard. So there's a bit of discrimination there. And they were talking about how our great interfaith work is done by you know, school children of different faith schools you know, meeting each other. And then I sort of came up and said there is not one Buddhist school in the whole of Australia. In Singapore, the Buddhist high school in Singapore, there's only one, there's many Christian schools, and it's now over 50% Buddhist country in Singapore. But even the Buddhist high school there, Manjushri, is called a third choice school. So, you know, many in even in Thailand, the schools, the Buddhist schools in Thailand, you know, not the elite schools at all, they get very little funding. So, and there's no Buddhist schools at all in Malaysia. So, you know, there's a, even like a lack of education, and there's 30%, I think, Buddhists in Malaysia. So there's a lack of equal education opportunities. I just brought that up, but you know, it's not really interesting. So I was hissing a bit. Yeah. So that's just an example. What's going? On. Well, okay. One, two questions. We have to finish then after, afterwards. Yeah. Um, the images on television of the monks in Tibet that they don't look like hissing. They look like they're quite bad. Now that's actually an interesting one because when I saw those images, I thought I can't support that. That's not Buddhism. And if that was a Buddhist monk, then you know they're just really just going too far. That's what I heard, so I was going to say, that I got a message on the internet from a BBC reporter who said that that could have been sort of um, Chinese, very, very obviously uh, smart thing to do, to get sort of, uh, it's very easy to get a rope, get someone to dress up, kick in the door and make, have the cameras there. Because I know that did actually happen in Burma when they had some violence, this is not this, this demonstration, it was many years ago they had some of the people dress up as monks, but they didn't take off their shoes, and so people caught them on camera. <laughs> <laughs> and actually so they, they find out they weren't real monks, they were dressed up. Could have been that, but if there was real monks, I don't know. So, there was real monks, they just were not doing the right thing. So yes? Jesus said, love your enemies. Unfortunately, I haven't got that far. Yeah. It's again, love your enemies. So the Chinese saying is, love your enemies, but at a distance. <laughs> In other words, run away if they've got a gun. <laughs> you don't go up and hug them, you get shot. <laughs> it's, a, it's, different. it's a very hard thing to do, to love your enemies. There's, oh, there's another talk actually how to do that. First of all you have to forgive your enemies. And before you forgive your enemies you have to find something in them worthy of forgiveness. To see some redeeming feature, some beauty in them. And then when you see the redeeming beautiful feature in them it's much easier to forgive them. You've got something to love in them. When you have an enemy all you see is the, the qualities in them which made you hate them the pain and hurt which they caused you. To see the bigger picture, to see them more than that, is how we move towards unmitigated hatred, to seeing a bigger picture. 
and then moving forward to love. Can be done. It's a incremental, stage by stage, moving away from just seeing the pain into seeing something bigger. That's another story. I should and I did say to, but then I always give in. Go on. <laughs> I think she did actually, we, in the end, that she, we encouraged her to disrobe and move back to France and, you know, with her, her mum. And I think then she wrote back to say she felt much better. I think she was just getting too ascetic. You know, sometimes, you know, that people get into that. Especially when they, this is like a, a new monk or new monk problem. They decide, I'm a monk now, I'm going to get enlightened this week. And they just go for broke, rather being gentle. See, they even when we have retreats sometimes, they would say, I'm on a retreat now, this is it. <laughs> and that's aggressive. And that's, you know, it's not what a Buddha would do. You now, Buddha, is, these people got the idea, is compassionate and kind and peaceful. Not sort of you know, some tough guy, not some like superhero in the movies, who's always beating up people. It's very kind and peaceful. So sometimes we get into too, ascet too much asceticism. Okay, and you'll be too ascetic to make you to sit here any longer because we've already gone over 10 minutes time. And you've got your homes to go to. I've got my mat to go to. <laughs>